So I have a plan for today, which I'm this this doesn't happen often enough, which is clearly why I'm chuffed about it. So the plan is, and feel free to obviously um jump in if you would like to change it. Um just gonna go over kind of where we got to so far with this work, then go through where the guide is and get some feedback from you all about where where it is just now. Um and anything you would like us to do differently, anything you would like to add in, anything you would like to take away. And then, hi, Nicole. And then after that, we will um, have a think about the way we would like to kind of evaluate or measure the, the benefit of something like this. Um, so the kind of question, the core question we're wanting to ask people kind of before and after the use of something like this so we can see whether it helps, which is obviously the purpose of the work is to see whether something like this would make the process of um, either coming out of a clinical trial or ending a trial or anything like that a bit easier and a bit a bit kind of more supported. Um, and then I was going to talk a bit about some of the different pots of funding um, that might be available and how we could use them if we were to get them. Um, so that you can see kind of some possible future directions of where we get to with this. Um, and that's about it. Does that all sound okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the coffee's kicked in. We're good to go. Okay. So. Almost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I had to at home. Um, it was it was quite a large coffee, so I feel like the bottom of my coffee has kicked in before the top has. Um, so just to go over where we were so far, we've been working on some kind of uh, companion guide or resource to hopefully support people who either try to get onto a clinical trial and are not eligible, because um, we know that they often have very strict eligibility criteria that people often don't meet. And that can be both from the perspective of a person living with Parkinson's or a family member of someone living with Parkinson's, um, as well as people that join the study and that then stops or that the study might finish early or there's a kind of loss of study for somebody who might already be in that process. So it's it's a relatively broad remit in terms of who it's aimed at, but really it's a how do we support people through clinical trials from the potentially getting onto a trial to being in a trial to then potentially losing that trial? Um, so it's trying to kind of consider the the emotional impact, I guess, of those things. Stephen? Do we know the population that we're addressing? So the number of people who get turned down for trials, it could be three or it could be 30 or it could be 300. So just trying to scale this thing are we trying to match to help the needs of people who are in a large number or are they in a small number? That's a really good question. I think the actual numbers I don't have, but it's something we could potentially do a bit of a scoping exercise with in terms of the trials that we have going on in the network and the amount of people that come forward versus the amount of people that can't do it. Helen might know. Um, so Tom Ross has just asked me to do that, so I'm going to... Ooh. That's go handy. out to all the sites and get all that information next week so um, I'll have that shortly. We also know that some studies are kind of worse for it than others depending on the type of um, exclusion criteria there is and I'll come back to that a bit when I talk about one of the funding options that's come forward. Um, sorry Joe, did you put your hand up there as well? Well, I thought I did. There's definitely something not quite right with my teams. Um, I had just been going to say because um, the, the point that I was going to come to was emotion. And you, that's how you finished your introduction of what we should think about. And I think that I do feel that I had to hold back the tears quite often when we were having, partly because the people were so nice and so supportive. Yeah. But yeah. I think that it's it's like when I went to the World Parkinson's Congress, nobody mentioned beforehand, like, this will be a hugely emotional experience because yeah. you will never see so many people with Parkinson's in one place before. And I think it probably varies from trial to trial. But, you know, if your loved one is is going to start popping pills that, you know, we're not really sure what's going to happen or or whatever. I think there is quite a bit of emotion. And that this was specific to us. I mean, part of the reason Brendan was doing it is because he has a genetic mutation. And, you know, mm -hmm. obviously we've got three kids. My dad's also got Parkinson's. So he wants as much research to be done as possible before my yeah. kids are at the age where they might start so showing symptoms. 
And so for him, that was that was one of the kind of really emotive things about dropping out of the trial. Um, yeah. So I think we maybe do need a kind of page about, I mean, it maybe doesn't affect everyone that way, but some somewhere in there, there needs to be a bit of a chunk on um, beware emotional emotional impact may, may appear at some point. Absolutely. I think there's there's a hundred percent scope for that because I think that's certainly from my perspective why we started looking at this in the first place was that kind of thing of particularly when you have you know there's so much necessary hope and motivation for people to come forward yeah. at all. And so when that's taken away, of course that's going to have an emotional impact. And that emotional impact and the ripple effect of that can really vary kind of family unit to family unit because as you say, it's not just often it's these ripples of it's not just the one person it's the the hope that other people have the hope for the future the hope for mm -hmm. sometimes it's about hope for improvement in your own symptoms sometimes it's hope for change later down the line there's there's so many um different factors but yeah. we know that a lot of clinical research by its nature has to be quite non-emotive it has to kind of strip the emotion out of, of it mm -hmm. um and so i suppose one of the purposes of something like a companion guide is about saying can we help almost hold your hand through some of that or certainly manage expectations of that so that you're not going in blind or you're not kind of going in without that kind of awareness that this is going to have an emotional toll um and even if it's about better signposting of where to go or or a kind of support from other people who've gone through the same process um and we've certainly had that um just just recently in terms of um in the de in the dementia group that we've been working with where when you have someone who maybe exhibits more symptoms than some of the other group members that that can be quite jarring and quite um quite distressing to have to kind of face that and go oh okay this is this is a kind of potential future um and that can be very difficult so i think there's Absolutely. a lot of that, emotional things to think and about that really call it that that's exactly the same in parkinson's i think you know my yeah. my husband now finds it quite hard to spend a lot of time with my dad because that's just a reflect of where he's going yeah absolutely and I, so there's there's so much there and so much that isn't um thought about or when it is thought about it's thought about i think very separately to clinical research and i suppose what we're trying to do is actually say well there needs to be that support within the clinical um clinical setting so hopefully we can find ways to embed that in a way that is doable obviously and some of it might be about signposting to appropriate resources some of it might be about setting up some kind of um group for people who have um who are taking part in trials and act as a kind of social space to to share information about that but not from an information about the trial itself, but but that kind of more emotional support side. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, I suppose, is more a physical version of that. But mm -hmm. there's absolutely scope to say if what everyone is asking for is we want a group that we can go to and, and vent about this, then that's something that we need to look at whether we could um, support as, as partners in research. Stephen? I think the key thing here is we need to make sure we don't end up duplicating what's in place already. Yeah. One assumes that there is the emotional support group just for people with Parkinson's anyway, never mind clinical trials, because we're only dealing with a subset of people who go on clinical trials. Mm -hmm. That emotional need is there across the rest of the population as well. And so whether it's at the Scottish level, the UK level, the branch level, there has to be something in place at locally to support people yeah. emotionally as they're going through this journey. Because I did exactly the same thing after I was diagnosed. I went along to my very first Edinburgh branch meeting I didn't go back. I thought to myself, I don't want to see people like this, knowing yeah. that's the way I'm going to be. And so yeah. I figured out, I managed to overcome that. Uh, and I got more responsibility than most. But anyway, I think that's a, rather than doing it just for clinical research, let's see what there is in the wider world of Parkinson's that we could maybe pick, copy or piggyback on. Absolutely. Joe. Yeah, because there is also, um, Stephen, I don't know if you've been involved, you maybe are already with, with Eric as well as with the local group, because that, yeah, so again, there, there's sort of less of that sitting around thinking, oh, this is where I'm going, but more about finding out about what's going on clinically and, and in the research. Is, is, yeah, can also be emotionally useful too, actually. But do you think we could also, I, I don't know, because my, obviously my experience is just limited to the centre at Nine Wells. Um, the CRC. I'm not sure how, how it works in other parts of Scotland or the UK, but um, 
the support was fantastic once we started on the trial because we had this lovely lovely nurse and um the doctor who was called joe too um he who both were always there at every meeting i couldn't believe it that there was that much resource actually and so we got to know them really well and so if things did get a bit emotional you knew them well enough for it not to matter yeah. um and i didn't i didn't understand at the beginning that we would be followed so closely by the same two people i mean Brendan's um, consultant was there sometimes too, but it was the two of them who did all the work with him. And I think we just need to point that out somewhere that you're not going to be doing this on your own. You're really going to be supported and helped. And these people who do it are doing it day in, day out. It's their job. They understand what people are going through. And they were just fantastic, really. I don't know what, how it works in other places, but they were they were brilliant. I mean, I, I think Jack that's... would be really disappointed if I didn't respond to that, Jack. Because <laughs> <laughs> Jackie was the permanent person in my clinical trial. Uh, <laughs> I hardly got any support at all, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think, like Jackie, you recording. might be a really old friend of a of a really old friend of mine called Ali Stevens. Did you not set up something in Edinburgh together? Or are you um, not the right Jackie? No, no there's, there's, there's a quite right. a few Jackie cares in Lothian that I found. Oh, really? Keeping, okay. Yeah, we kept getting each other's emails. So, yeah. Because she helped to set up a clinical research centre at the Western a long time ago. <sighs> I I was only in the Western from about 2015, so it may have been pre, pre my uh, time. Another, another Jackie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Another... A lot of small worlds have other Jackie cares, but also potentially in research. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it does make me think, though, when you think about the, the people that follow you really closely and you build that kind of connection and, and bond with. Has there been or would it be helpful to have any kind of transition then away from that relation? Because I suppose if you've had all that support and then that stops, is that part of the part of the issue or part of the challenge? Not just that a trial has stopped, but actually that the people that have been kind of, I suppose, holding your hand for want of a better phrase through this process, then you potentially don't have that access yeah. to those people anymore. Does that? I was exactly thinking about that on, on my dog walk, that I re actually really miss seeing them because they're super yeah. nice. Um, but, you know, I know we're not part of their responsibility anymore, but no, I'll be pushing Brendan to get on another trial so we can see them again. Yeah. But cool. also that on, one, on what Stephen was saying, I think was so right about um, maybe not creating too many duplications because yeah. actually starting on a trial, you do have to go to these meetings and then you also have to do whatever follow-ups physical yeah. measurements and stuff needs to be done at home so if you're you know a working partner you're already creating more time in yeah. your in your diary to deal with all of that to then have to sort of feel that you really maybe ought to go to this group because maybe you're meant to do that and maybe it's really helpful you know that I think we don't want to make people feel that there's leave them things where yes. they can go and get it if they yes. need it don't make Absolutely. it seem like a, an obligation yeah so I what think you said so, on the Edinburgh branch is when someone's newly diagnosed, we run a, a course for them to explain the journey they're going to go through. And then mm. we start start the, the dialogue with them and try and encourage them to come along to, we run a series of different cafes now, we just call them cafes. We've got a thing called the Butterfly Cafe that runs every month. We've got one that started in Nidri, we've got one at Female Head. Basically where you go and talk to people who are like you. You just sit and we have a chat. The branch provides the coffees and the, tea, the biscuits and we would just encourage people to come and have a chat. I was at one in Nidri where this uh, man arrived with his partner and the partner said, look, we, I have no idea what Parkinson's is. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen to my partner. Can someone please explain it? And to have that sort of support group around you is so important. So I'm yeah. trying to build a, a series of what we just described as social cafes around Edinburgh where we can get people together and try and help them through this emotional journey or we could help them through what happens when you take this med, or we can help you through what all sorts of things. But to me, the most important thing is to sit down with other people and just share your thoughts. In a free and open society, just share your thoughts. You will, no, one's, no one's judging you in any way at all, because we're all on slightly different journeys. Absolutely. And I, I think absolutely not replicating what's going on and making sure that we do some good signposting to here's where you can go that's already offering this type of support versus um here's what's kind of unique to 
to what we're doing. Um, and it did make me think, Nicol, if I could ask you quickly, I know you've done some work um, with the surgical trial example. Um, are you able to share a bit about the kind of support outputs that came from that study? Happy to. So can you hear me OK? Sorry, my yeah. headphones have died, so I'm using the internal mic. Um, so with that with that particular project, we're actually producing two publications. So one is on a, a support package for people, because on that particular trial, which is a GDNF, highly invasive um, and, and ran over many years, uh, people felt like they were just left you know, on a cliff edge right at the end of the trial and they didn't know what to do. Um, so as a consequence of that, that group of people who took part in that original trial have uh, put together a support package. So that's a pre during and post trial support package, which includes psychological support, social support, um, things that are not naturally built into clinical trials due to budget restrictions. Oh, am I right in thinking Nichols disappeared suddenly? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know, something weird's happening. Oh. My webcam is just automatically turning itself on and off. So uh, that's fine, you're back with us. <laughs> I don't know why that's happening. Um, so yeah, so we, we, we're putting this uh, package together. So I've, I've actually completed the abstract for it. Um, and we're going to be sending it to a number of different uh, journals, including the Journal of Parkinson's Disease, Lancet, and so forth. So I'm happy to share the, the sort of the manuscript when, once it's ready. Um, but we want to encourage other people who are, uh, you know, doing these sorts of trials to actually build in all this support so that people just don't feel neglected. Um, and again, you don't really normally on a clinical trial, you wouldn't have psychological support you wouldn't have the ability to go to speak to a um a counselor for example if you're going through you know difficult it's just not what's uh you know naturally done so uh hopefully this will kind of make changes in, in the approach in which clinical trials especially invasive clinical trials neurosurgical trials neuromodulatory trials which are um you know far more um you know there's far more emotional burden on those trials so yeah mm -hmm. That's really useful to know. Thank you. And I suppose it's again about when thinking of uh, not not duplicating things, being aware of how at the moment the kind of what we're looking at is a kind of that broader spectrum of research trials. And one of the things I think we'll want to do with the um, package that that your work has has created is look at where those similarities and differences might be. Do we think that that the same package would be useful across all trials or actually do we think there might be differences based on your experience with the um with other types of clinical trials that we need to be pulling out um and so it might be that the kind of once that's available that next stage of our guide is about really going where are those similarities and differences so that we have a, a kind of glo global view um and i think it's where again where we're, we're well placed in the network because of the fact that we have that that broad spectrum of um, clinical trials that are going on across Scotland. So we've got we've got we've got an area in which to to use that, which is which is very helpful. Um, Rosie, it's also really positive to hear it. Yes, Stephen, and go quickly. So I think we need to sort of focus in on the area that we're trying to serve here. Are we just talking about clinical trials? Because there's a whole range of other things that are trials and research. So just to give you an example. Uh, someone who's then sent a form which is completely anonymized that says, can you measure the following things and send the data in? You know, we're not looking to try and provide some emotional support for that. The, the completely other end of the spectrum, these invasive brain you know, mm -hmm. tests are going on. That's almost at the other end of the spectrum. So we need to work out what's the market that we're trying to serve and what does that market need? Does it need you know, hands-on emotional support like Joe was des describing? Or is it just, it's only a, a form that you fill in, it's completely anonymized, you don't need any. So I think partly it's up to, to you guys in terms of what you feel would be most, um, my cat's now doing what your dog was doing, Jo. She, she's hearing some people talking and thinking it must be her. Um, so part of it is is about what you guys want to see, um, what you guys think would be most helpful. It may be that we start with, say, looking at the less invasive clinical trials, for example, but that we build from that the kind of the other research studies and look at those what we need to maybe add in or take away depending on that. Um, I think in an ideal world, this resource would be one that grows quite naturally based on the needs of 
um, this group and the groups of people with Parkinson's and their family members that we come across. Um, because I suppose it links slightly, I'm going to jump slightly to when I was thinking about the different um, funding pots. And the reason I'm jumping to that a little bit is because one of the things we talked about last meeting about doing was looking at trying to get people in a room um, in a physical space and kind of discuss together, like play around with this guy in a bit more of a kind of hands on way and say, actually, we want to keep this. We think this would be helpful. Actually, well, let's let's change this slightly. Let's, you know, let's move it all around together. I think very helpful to invite things like the research, people from research interest groups, um, people that are currently engaged in clinical trials um, in Parkinson's, you know, open it up to say, we really want to hear from you because this is a resource that we want you to be able to use. Um, Nicole. I'm just, I'm just wondering whether it would it be worse in, in terms of Stephen's uh, question, um, looking at the portfolio of projects that the NDN currently look after and seeing what 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 are the majority of trials that are running via this network and then designing something for for this group yes because obviously yes, there's but... such a widespread number of trials there's bespoke things being created like I, I attended a neuromodulatory and neurotech uh, uh, conference last week in Nottingham and that was specifically around you know DBS and uh, you know uh, transcranial ultrasound and, and all this kind of stuff so maybe it's to look yeah. at the you know the projects that you have and to serve those projects in in the best way we can absolutely absolutely Joe, do you want to come in there yeah I think that sounds very sensible um and that's sort of what hit me well Stephen's question hit me when I looked at slide number seven at the moment which is the what do we mean by research one which I think is trying to illustrate you know how varied it can be and I agree with Stephen that you know ticking boxes on a on a form doesn't really need emotional support but when you're when you're sort of linking about how we choose what we're doing to how we're going to fund it then probably we need to be able to demonstrate that whatever we produce is going to help to perhaps reduce some of the time required by these wonderful nurses and doctors in the clinical research centres, because you've given them much more of the background before they actually get to the first meeting. Um, if those people feel that that, that is true, that what, what's going to be provided in this piece of information would help them to reduce a bit of the talking that they have to do at the beginning of a, of a trial. Absolutely. So I suppose this is where it, it links into that very kind of concept of co-research and saying we've kind of got this this prototype that we've developed together and we want to see whether it's of, of benefit um, and whether it would help, say, a research population. Um, um, we had a com we had a conversation with uh, Gordon Duncan on last Thursday, who is Jackie, please remind me his title. He's a consultant physician in medicine of the elderly in Western. He's got, he's got so many other titles as well. So it's like, yeah, I that's, mean, that's, that's his, that, <laughs> yeah, he's he's um that's his main one. I think he's doing uh he's like a NRS or a clinical research lead or something. There's other there's other parts to his um his title. So yeah. I mean, Stephen might know better than me, I but I just know he's a medical clinical title. lead. Yeah. He's basically Esther. In Dundee, Joe. In Dundee, yeah. right. Okay. Can I just say, from a patient point of view, I do not like being described as medicine for the elderly. I'd love you to get rid of that title. Mm. You know, we've, we're, we're yeah. other things than just being old. So. I know, I know. But unfortunately, that's his title and I can't, <laughs> we can't change that. We'll take <laughs> that up with him. <laughs> uh, we can absolutely say that we dislike it, though. And actually, one yeah, of the things yeah. in in a different piece of work that Rose and I um, are going to be sending you away at some point is actually going to be asking you about terminology that we should be avoiding um, where possible um, because we know we've done quite a lot of work with that with the uh, population of people with dementia in terms of how we refer to people living with dementia, how we try avoid terms like sufferer, that kind of thing. But I think we need to do the same with the other neuroprogressive conditions that we work with. We need to kind of get a good um, kind of library of terms to avoid so that we can at least encourage others to change those terms. So that's absolutely on the agenda, just a slightly different different group agenda, but it is on there because you are absolutely not the only one that finds that frustrating, Stephen. 
Um, and I imagine Gordon does as well. <laughs> um, but we were talking about that there are some possible studies coming up that they're expecting to have quite a high um, number of people who are not eligible. Um, so they're expecting to have a, the amount of people that come forward and actually get onto the trial, they're expecting to be quite, quite different. Um, so one of the potential options is whether we could maybe work alongside that study and say, could we provide this resource at the start and see whether people find it helpful um, and use it to kind of complement each other to kind of say, let's use it with this trial as a, as a starting point. And if we were to do something like that, the main thing that we would need to do, obviously, is finish our prototype of this is what we think would work for now. Um, obviously, there's always going to be changes, but also thinking about what those key questions are that we're trying to answer. Um, so, for example, one of the things that we could include at the start would be um, how confident are you feeling about taking part in the clinical trial or how um, how aware do you feel you are of the various support options for people within clinical trial? There's kind of questions that we could ask um, and ask people to, you know, let's let's say, for example, rate on a scale of one to ten. Um, and then we would ask the same questions um, at the end of the companion guide or at the end of the study, depending on how we how we aligned these things. Um, but what that would enable us to do is to say, well, actually, this many people um, tried to go, get onto this study. They were offered this companion guide. And we found that in an ideal world, that the majority of people found that they found the trial a more positive experience or, or whatever by having this available to them. Um, that's a very simplified version of how we could do it. We would need to do lovely things like epics and make sure that we were really comfortable with what we were asking. But I think in terms of the direction we could go with this, um, this piece of work, there's that two stages of it. There's the co-creating it to something you are happy with and bringing in as many voices as we can to say, have we included everything? And then there's the putting it alongside research and saying, is this helpful? Does it do what we want it to do? Um, and do we need to be making changes or anything like that? So that's kind of where we're at in terms of um, what we have so far and where we could go with it. So, Does that okay. sound like what you wanted? Stephen, on you go. So uh, again, going back to what we said earlier, we need to work out what is it we want the, the person that we deal with to feel at the end of all of this. So I put my hand up, I say, like, I'd like to take part in clinical trial X13. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you've been rejected. Go and meet someone from this group. What's, what would we expect them to feel like at the end of the consultation with the, someone from this group? So it's almost saying, what's the objective that we're trying to achieve from involving people who've been turned down or ending their clinical trial? What do we, what do we want them to be like at the end of the interaction with us? So I suppose in a really annoying way, I'm going to turn the question back around to you and say, what would you have wanted? So in that situation, what would you want to get from something like this? I'd, I'd probably want to get something that tells me what the next steps are, and which I've now got. Thank you, Jackie. That's all fine. And I can make the meeting. So I'll be there. <laughs> um, I think the key thing is probably more to do with one where you get rejected. I think we need to explain why you know, what, what, is there a good process for telling someone you are not part of this clinical trial because X, Y and Z do not appear on your medication or whatever? So some of the medication says you know, if you're on this medication, you can't take part. Others say if you can only be part of this clinical trial if you've been diagnosed within the last two years. So again, to try and explain to the individual the reason for this cutoff is for the following reasons. Is yeah. But then you need to have someone who understands what the cutoffs are all about. So we need to get them explained by the consultant or whoever to whoever the familiar face is going to be to then just kind of, you know, take them through the process. So there's a yeah. number of things that need to fall into place before we can do this. So do we need to maybe add more, I'm going to say slides, in that, that cover possible reasons that you might not be eligible and maybe go into a bit more detail? So there's some examples of 
you know common criteria that means people can't be involved so sometimes it might be if you also have a diagnosis of uh, depression um and then we could have an explanation for why this might be the case um I think to me the explanation is the most important part you know, yeah. having, you know, obviously there are criteria so if you've not been diagnosed within the last two years or whatever you're excluded for the following reasons and this is why it's, yeah. it's, it's explain why it's so important so you're sort yeah. of like dangling i'd love to take part in this trial no you can't because you've yeah. not been diagnosed in the last two years why and there's never an answer there yeah. if you don't answer that question then i think we'd solve a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve yeah I mean, that makes sense. I think often we're just presented with the list and not the, but here's why the list is that is that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. That So that makes sense. And it, I think it's absolutely something we could, you know, we could talk to some of the um, investigators of current studies and say, can you give us some common reasons why people aren't, aren't involved? And then we can help explain that. Jackie. Sometimes, um, despite all the detective work that we all do for pre-screening, um, it comes, the person may be eligible to go through the screening process, then something else, puts them out, such as a blood test. or So I think obviously we have to consider that as well. And um, they may have met the initial criteria based on, yeah. like you said, years of diagnosis and medications and things. And an unbeknown thing pops up from a blood test that we don't have any control over. So sometimes that can happen. Again, we have to manage that expectation that, sorry, you can't go any further in the trial because of this. It could be something yeah. as simple as vitamin B12, which can be corrected after a specific, they can be rescreened, but it's all about getting that information across in the correct way and make sure they, like you said, they fully understand. Look, we really would like you to be on the trial, but for your safety, yeah. Yeah. and you know, we, we really can't take you any forward for this particular study, but it's about how you get that across and make sure, like you said, Stephen, they understand. You, know, you might not, you know, this is the reasons why, and Really yeah. explain so that that would definitely be a help but we I think um you know unfortunately sometimes exclusions are sometimes out with the person's control because yeah. they don't know yeah. what a specific thing so, so it seems to me we're, we're really targeting three populations there's the population that get rejected up front who don't actually get on the trial mm -hmm. the second population that starts the trial but for whatever reason a bit like Joe was describing earlier on leaves the trial again for whatever reason so that's population number two and i think yeah. population number three is people who have gone through the trial who are left sort of feeling empty or dangling or yes yeah. so we could maybe tailor what we offer to these three different groups there may be some commonality but more likely than not there's going to be something that are unique to the group so yeah. something unique to the people you can't take part because you've got red hair why does that matter it's going to be different from someone who's been accepted who suddenly finds, you know, halfway through the trial for whatever reason, they don't want to continue to support yeah, them. Yeah. And then again at the end of the trial. So again, that would be a Absolutely. Useful and maybe a useful way to, just thinking from a practical perspective, if we think of, say, a, a guide that people can dip in and out of, being able to go, oh, I'm in that group. Okay, I can go straight to that and have a look. I think that would be very helpful. Um, Joe, what about you? Is there any things that you think this would have been really helpful to either know beforehand or to know at any point during the process that we could um, spotlight? Um, I think just what I said about the fact that you have this this um, really good support team kind of looking after you the whole way through is important. And maybe maybe it is worth saying, you know, not everyone makes it through all the different stages and you really need to be ready for that. We should probably say that loud and clear somewhere. Yeah. Um, so because in the various questions that I was trying to answer on the the way you sent through the PowerPoint this time. Yeah. Um, the. Is there any types of research you would like more information on? I mean, I, I think at that point we say, you know, research comes in many forms, but this booklet is designed to support people doing X type of research. Yeah. Um, so that so that it's really clear that it's for the kind of more sort of potentially emotionally charged and the type that you might have to drop more like it's more likely that you might end up having to give up yeah that makes that makes sense and we can always have a kind of summary of those those other sorts of research that are available but yeah the ongoing benefit clinical as much. trials page i would definitely keep that in because yeah that's exactly where they might start looking if they do have to drop out of whatever they were doing yeah absolutely nicole did you want to come in there 
Is it? I'm just going to ask: Is this? Um, will this be specifically for uh, design for Parkinson's, or will it be the other disease areas as well? Because obviously, exclusion criteria can be unique to the disease area that you fall in, and the vocabulary used. So, uh, how wide are we going with this? At the moment, the focus is kind of co-creating it with people um, affected by Parkinson's. I think there is absolutely scope that if we find that it is a helpful resource or something like this resource is helpful, that we could then go, what would we need to do differently for, say, Huntington's or motor neuron disease or MS? And again, we're quite well placed because we do studies in those areas across the network to kind of say, OK, well, let's let's start looking at those differences. Um, and I think there's a similar kind of thing with the dementia group saying actually there could be a lot of a lot of overlap that we could come together and work on but I think starting with Parkinson's um, particularly because we know that there is quite a few different studies that are going on at the moment that are relatively invasive or, or certainly require quite a lot of commitment from people um, and then kind of build, build out as we go but I think it's it's really kind of trying to marking in the sand to say this is where we're at so far and this is how we can build on it um but yeah i think it'd be something that's absolutely um i would imagine very useful for those other disease areas too um because there is a lot of although the, as you say although the eligibility criteria might change the process of a clinical trial is very similar across these different things um and there's different different things that come up um OK, so my suggested plan. Have we is... just screwed up your plan, Rosie? <laughs> Say again? Have we just screwed up your plan? For no, me? no. What you've done is you've enhanced my plan, Stephen. You've, <laughs> you've, give, you've given it lots of weight, which is what it needed. Um, because I suppose the last bit to go through is from what we've got from this discussion, the plan would be that I will start filling in the gaps that are there and um, we'll try and make it into a, a near complete prototype. One of the things that is on there that I didn't know if you wanted on there or not, but whether we want to include some um, kind of personal stories of being involved in this type of work, whether you think that would be helpful. So I think I put it as kind of a story of someone with Parkinson's and a story of a family member. Um, whether you think that would be helpful to have there um, and whether you might be willing to share some of your experience in that um, to use within this prototype or whether you think that would be something to go separately. I'm, I'm not sure what your thoughts are with the kind of how much, how many, uh, I suppose, examples in terms of that lived experience do you think would be helpful? I think the challenge with the lived experience is um, when do you use it? Do you put it up there as a catalogue or a list to be chosen from? Or do you actually say, well, it depends on the individual. And when you're having one-to-one -one conversations, you might want to bring some of that into the, co the conversation. I think you know, having a, a catalogue up there that says, you know, Stephen Brannan did the Xenotype trial and came out the end of it. Um, I'm not sure you'd want to put that up as a sort of a have a go at Stephen type thing. You know, he could maybe Whereas if I was in a discussion with someone, I'd, I'd be able to talk through my experience of having been on the clinical trial and come to the end of it. Um, so I'm in two minds. I, I think mm -hmm. on a one-to-one -one basis, I feel quite comfortable talking about it. Whether yeah. I would want it to be included in a catalogue, you know, if you're worried about the end of a clinical trial, speak to Stephen Brown, I'm, I'm not quite so confident about that. Yeah, that makes sense. And it wouldn't necessarily have to be kind of speak to you after, but it could just be a, here is an example of someone's experience. But I think... Um, it makes yeah, it makes complete sense that there's there's two minds there. Um, oh, our screen's changed. Is that because you're going to that slide, Helen? Um, Joe, do you want to come in there? Um, yeah, just to say, I think um, it's a really good idea to have this sort of face to face um, round a table once we get the next version of the proposal, and because um, it's obviously you're only just hearing two voices or one voice from from family and one voice from from person with Parkinson's. And I think if we had that discussion, a really good open discussion about what people think about this, we would probably also get some good quotes that mm -hmm. we could take. And I mean, they don't even necessarily need to be attributed. They could just be, you know, and th this is the sorts of responses we've had from people who've been through trials. And this is some of the reactions of family members. 
And we do have a list of people who would be very happy to talk to you if you would rather talk to a person with lived experience mm -hmm. than, a, than a clinical person. And I would be quite happy for my name to be to be on a list but but as Stephen says on a list sort of for people who ask and for whom my experience is relevant if you know what I mean yeah absolutely and I suppose that isn't something we've we've thought too much about but whether we do have this kind of contact tree of it would be helpful to speak to this person because they've they've been through it um and whether that's something we could kind of facilitate as a kind of core group and say let's um let's bring people together because we do have um a scheme that we're building with our kind of general partners in research of kind of pairing um new members with someone who's already been part of these types of activities in order to say mm -hmm. this is the sort of thing we've been involved in um and to make it hopefully easier to join a group meeting um and i suppose a similar thing could be used here where we say we could um, pair you up with someone who's had that similar experience so that you can have that conversation um, but kind of monitoring the amount of contact that you're then getting and making sure that, that that's kind of balanced. Um, okay so it sounds like one of the things that would be helpful in terms of um, where we focus next in terms of pots of funding the priority Lucy, Lucy, is... Lucy, Lucy, before you do that yeah. I just have a final comment on, on my comment that's been said. If I can use an analogy of the dating sites, I don't want to be up on a dating site where someone contacts me directly and says, do you fancy going out? I would rather use the introductory type of the dating yeah. site where you are the central pot where someone says, can you please find me someone who's done this? So I would definitely yeah. not be happy for my name to just be included and for anyone to contact yes. me. Yes, yeah, yes, I, I agree I, that. Yeah, I think we would you, need, you to, need, be need to, to be the central hub to be relevant. That the yeah. experience has to be relevant yeah no that makes complete i'm a little bit worried about how many bits of work we're doing at the moment people have referred to dating sites in um i feel like i might need to go and just have a word with myself about that um because the familiar <laughs> face thing was referred to as tinder as well at one point and i thought oh dear what are we doing um <laughs> but yes <laughs> separate to that i think absolutely we we would never i think it would be far too much to expect you know to say here's the contact details how, on you go because we also don't know, we wouldn't necessarily know uh, as this grew how many people were receiving a copy, how often you were. So no, we would absolutely, I think if we were going to include some kind of, if you would like to talk to someone with that shared experience, we would need to um, make sure that that was managed centrally to make sure that no, there was no um, no pressure to say yes, firstly, on the side of people with that experience, but also making sure that people understand the purpose of that conversation and that it's not necessarily a, I'm going in a kind of almost counselling capacity to this person, because that's also not appropriate in this context. So I think there's a lot of things we would need to to put in place and to think about. Um, but it's also, yeah, maybe how we, as you say, build up some of those quotes, build up some of those experiences. And we might find that Certainly, we found with the with other groups that for some people sharing that that story and getting it out there um, is a quite a cathartic process and a process of okay, I've I've told my story and I feel seen and heard and I want that to be available as an example. And for other people, it's well, I want I'm happy to share my story as as you said, even one to one, but I don't necessarily want that story on a poster out out. So you know, everyone's going to have a different sit quite differently with how how they want to um share their experience and that's absolutely fine um so we were looking at the final bit on the on the things to think out we were looking at how to build this work and and really um make sure it gets where it needs to get to and there's obviously aspects of which we can keep doing without any additional funding but if we were to do something like bring people together in an in-person meeting, it would be really helpful if we had some additional funding to, you know, even for simple things like making sure there's tea and coffee available. Um, so there's some possible funds that we were talking to Gordon about um, in Edinburgh that might be suitable for having a day together where we kind of, and we could print out some prototypes of this and, as I say, play around with it and see what people wanted um, and absolutely then invite um, local research interest groups. Um, I think it would be good if that sort of meeting was hybrid so that people who may be further afield but wanted to share their opinion absolutely could. Um, and then the kind of wider options for funding with where it comes to these bigger organisation funding pots would be about 
the more kind of research side of it of going, could we look at whether this resource that we've created together is of use? And that's when you'd start going, let's look at how people experienced the clinical trial before and after having that resource. Um, so I think there's two parts. There's kind of part A, which is let's really co-create this together and make sure we're all really happy with what this resource looks like. And then we've got the let's then see how helpful it is in practice. Um, and and uh, to what to what scale we do that might depend partly on funding, but also on what studies are going on. As I say, there is potentially some studies coming up that could be a really good um, study to link into because of the fact there's an expectation of, I think it's because it's to do with high blood pressure, but actually the majority of people are more likely to have low blood pressure or something, something as simple as that, that it's, there's just this discrepancy that's likely to be there. Um, so we will, Rose and I um, have a meeting. So I'm away next week, um, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for me. And then we're away at a conference. But then Rose and I have a meeting to go through some of these funding pots and make sure we know um, what we need to do to see what we can secure. But the plan would be to send around an update of what we have so far based on the discussions from today. Then to um, update you on what we would need to do to get the kind of if we were to get a small pot of funding for having an in-person um, meeting and see if there's anything you would like us to think about for that. And then I think once we've got all that in place, all our ducks in a row, then we can look at the kind of what next. Does that sound what we were expecting? Does that sound helpful? Um, quite a nice plan for going forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I was going to suggest actually you guys could have um, we've got new, a new office at Parkinson's UK, but then uh, we're in London. I mean, if if you want to pay to bring us all down, I mean, I'm happy to. <laughs> that's we'll have the expensive. budget for the teas and coffees. I'm not sure about the uh, flights and trains. <laughs> yeah, the downside of being based in Scotland, um, but you know, if we, if we if we go on big scale, we can absolutely look at different things like that. Um, but I think that will be a really nice way of bringing in um, additional voices and just kind of saying whether we're all on the same page. Um, and I think hopefully, do you know a timescale, Nicol, for when your um, publications are due out uh, roughly? It will be, I think we'll have a, a full manuscript um, to submit in the next two to three months. So okay, we, have perfect. we have abstracts, which what we're doing is we're actually just, rather than writing the whole thing and it being rejected, we're just going to send it out to a few publications just to see their thoughts and whether yep. they think it's, you know, they will have any improvements for us and then we'll start writing the whole thing. Yeah, yeah that makes complete sense. And that I think would time quite well to us um, potentially setting up an in-person event. So we'll have that in the able to kind of say this is where it compares this is where because I think you know we do always need to stay as on top of as possible whereas already doing things that we think are helpful and working and make sure we celebrate that rather than conflict with that because we're all we all have the same goal essentially we're all trying to make things um better and improve the experience of people um going through this process so I think the more we can um learn from what each other are doing the better um, what a difference it makes when I make a plan beforehand. I'm doing, <laughs> I, I would do this more often. Um, no, it's it's got it definitely feels like it's at a point where we can be a bit more structured with it. When you first kind of, you know, padding out the ideas, you don't quite know which direction it's going to go. But I think there seems to be quite a clear. We're happy with the general where we're at with the prototype. Build in some of the stuff we've said from today, and then look about getting into a room and tearing it apart or building it up depending on how we're feeling that day um and then we can look at comparing that um in in actual practice and research studies and see if it's a benefit to people um fabulous that feels very productive thank you very much everyone for coming along is there any other points anyone would like to raise before we go and top up our coffees and such it's everyone not the parkinson's happy? conference that you're going to is it rosalie no, it's um okay. outside of Europe actually this time. So um so unfortunately I won't be able to see it. Is that one you're going to? Yeah, see I and, just thought yeah. maybe we could have met face to face, which oh, well, is that, always useful. <laughs> that would have been lovely. Um we can definitely try and arrange that um when I'm back though. That would absolutely be fabulous. Which, yeah. which um, conference is this, Joe? Sorry. 
Um, it's the the Parkon conference in Leeds, the AGM. Yeah. Oh, Parkon, yeah. So I should see you guys there then. Um, we, oh, you'll we, just be there, right. we just had a meeting on uh, on it basically within our team in terms of who's doing what and so forth. Right. Just again to let you know, we held the Edinburgh Annual Parkinson's Lecture last Tuesday. And if you go onto the Edinburgh website now, you can get a recording of the presentation and also the slides. Great, thank you. Brent, Brendan was there, but unfortunately I couldn't make it. Okay. He said it was very good. Yeah, she did a great job doing that presentation. Yeah, she's lovely. All right, and it, was, it was very interesting when, because she, she was in Barcelona at the, the World Park, Parkinson's Congress last summer. And she said that when she'd been at Kyoto, she was the only nutritionist there talking about the importance of nutrition and I think probably in a big way thanks to her I think there were 24 of them um, many of whom had posters and stuff at the World Parkinson Convention. Yeah. I, I was presenting at well, WPC as well in Barcelona I was on a panel where I was pharma but yeah, I had never been to a conference like that ever that number of people with the uh, with the condition being at the conference and being fully integrated in, in certain segments of it was Unreal. The clapping yeah. at the end when everyone was leaving was just unbelievable. The CP makes such a difference, doesn't people it? to come in and clapping for people to leave the conference. I've never experienced anything like that. Yeah. And that's what talking to to some of the like younger researchers who were there, they all said exactly the same. My God, we've never been to a conference like this. <laughs> it makes we went, so Brendan and difference. I went to, as volunteers, which is a really good way to go because you don't have to pay the con conference fee. And also yep. that was really helpful because you immediately had this mega support network because nearly all the volunteers were either people with Parkinson's or people, families with people with Parkinson's or people who'd lost people through Parkinson's. So, you know, they, they like you didn't need to explain. They all just understood. So that was really nice, actually. It's definitely I think I certainly know from the outside majeure one that we're going to. Um, last year had quite a big contingent of Scottish people uh, with lived experience of dementia there and the difference it made to, as you said, younger researchers feeling that kind of real grounded, this is why we're doing this, um, yeah. but also just to constantly check how we communicate science and keep keep you right in terms of accessibility, but just really helping constantly reinforce this is why we do what we're doing when it's not separate to the real world and what's going on. Um, so I think, it, yeah, it can make a huge difference. And I don't know if we already have Helen, but could we um, promote the link to the Edinburgh presentation on our social media? Um, just, just to draw attention to it um, so that um, it's on the Edinburgh website, did you say, Stephen? Yeah. So uh, Edinburghparkinson's.org. We had uh, 250 people in person in the lecture awesome. theatre. And we had over 900 people streaming it online. That's yeah. incredible. That's really that's, amazing. That's globally. It's not just in the UK. Yeah. We have people from the States. We have people from Australia. It's just wonderful. I follow the Edinburgh Parkinson's branch, Stephen, because you've just um, promoted all our Parkinson's trials in Edinburgh. So um, I've just retweeted that this morning, but I'll retweet your slides and presentation as well. Thanks, Helen. That, that'd be great. Um, and I'll pop it onto the Drig site as well, because we had the talk advertised. So I'll add the, okay, um, the link. A lot. Fabulous. Excellent meeting, Rosie. Yeah, lots of productivity. Look at us go. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I'm really excited to see um, the next steps of this. So we'll send you a kind of updated version based on our chat. Um, and anything else you want us to do, remember this is this is yours as much as, you know, so anything you want changed or that you think should be in there, just, just shout and we will do our best to accommodate it. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.